Welcome to West Country Wanderings and a big welcome to Canal Update number 11. Here we go again. This is the Stroudwater Canal and there's lots of exciting things happening the other side of that bridge there. I'm currently in the middle of the Whitminster roundabout. I've got the A38 between Bristol and Gloucester spinning around so you probably hear the occasional car horn, bit of traffic noise. Apologies for that. I'm going to show you what's been happening over there as close as I can get because they have fenced it off for obvious reasons or reasons that will become apparent. And the main focus of this update is actually going to be talking about the Sapperton Tunnel and we'll be going to the Sapperton Tunnel later in today's video. Now, a word of warning, I do apologise for any continuity errors in today's video because I've filmed it over several days. So there'll be lots of changes of clothing, different weather. We've got heavy rain and winds forecast so I do apologise for the wind noise today. So, the coat will probably come off on different t-shirts etc so look out for that anyway we're here i'm going to tell you more about what's happening and give you an update on the stridewater and thames and seven canals here in gloucestershire so the other end of this whitminster roundabout this new section here at the stridewater canal been doing lots of work in fact yesterday they had a big open day not so much to do with canals more to do with archaeology in the field over there, which is currently closed while well, they've got all the diggers digging there and I'm trying to get some more shots from around the other side of the roundabout with my telephoto lens in a bit. They had an open day to bring people in to have a look at the finds. In fact, there was a Roman, possibly a Roman camp, not so much a villa, just the other side of the roundabout here before you get to the M5. And that, of course, is where the new section of the Stroud Water is going to go. I say new section because it's going to be on a different route to get it underneath the M5 than what the original section of the canal was. They had some brilliant finds here yesterday, or over the past few days, should I say. And I'll insert some of the photographs that the Cotswold Canals Trust, I'll give them a credit, so thank you, Cotswold Canals Trust. And what they found here, some brilliant finds, they've been working some top archaeologists. That isn't the only thing that's been happening here though, or continues to happen, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Over this side I've been getting some press attention as well, in fact as I record this tonight on Gardner's World on BBC Two, a place called Pockets Orchard, which is just down by the bridge there, Capation Bridge for the farm. On the other side of that is an orchard, and the volunteers of the Cotswold Canal Trust have been working in conjunction with the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust to bring in some rare apple species back into that orchard there, and also clear that orchard. So. It gives you a nice nap piece of nature by the side of the towpath when this canal reconnects back to the network at Saw Junction. Now, I just wanted to say, it looks like now they are going with that plan to get the canal through using the channel, the River Froome, underneath the M5. I showed you back that in Canal Update, can't remember, <laughs> seven, something like that, six or seven. I put that in below and uh, you can see that there, though the footpath from here, from the Westminster direction, is closed towards the M5 moment because of the aforementioned digging and the preparation of getting the canal back into use and also the archaeological work that's going on. So it is a closed site, but I say I'll try and bring you some more shots of that. So it looks like they're going with that. So it's going from the Whitminster roundabout rather than going in a straight line following the main road, the A419, towards junction 13 of the M5. It's going to go on a diagonal route across the field and then go underneath the M5 and then a diagonal route back again towards Chipman's Platte before it joins up with the section that's in water there at Easington. Now you may be wondering why I'm filming some of this underneath the A38 here. Well, it's actually just chucking it down with rain. I wanted to keep not only myself dry, more importantly, the camera. I don't have a weather sealed camera. Bits of light rain is fine, but it is actually just chucking it down. So it's protecting the old camera as well as keeping the old bombs dry at the moment. Now, before we go on to the Thames and Seven Canal and the portals of the Sapperton Tunnel, which I know you're looking forward to, I'm looking forward to that. I'm hoping to include some images, some older images are now copyright expired from books that I've got in that as well, just to illustrate the enormity of that project. When the Sapperton Tunnel was built, it was the longest canal terminal in the entirety of the canal system in England. It is, still is, still exists, 3,490 metres, which I think is 3,817 feet long, enormous long. And it was the longest until 1812, when another tunnel exceeded that length. 
I think it was the Netherton Tunnel. I'll check on that and put that in below. No, as I say, it's absolutely enormous project. It is going to be part of the restoration, but it's actually in phase three. Now, what does that mean? I have mentioned this before, I just highlight it again. Where I'm standing at the moment is section phase 1B, which is going to link Easington and therefore the town of Stroud in the southern part of the Cotswold, right back to the canal system at Saw Junction. 1A was getting the section through Stroud complete. So 1A has been done. 1B is the missing mile effectively and the bridge underneath the M5 and re-digging the canal through, clearing out some locks and turbulence, all that kind of stuff. That's 1B. Phase two is the section we looked at previous videos, which is the section from Inglesham Lock right through to the Cotswold Water Park. And obviously there is a lot of work to do on that, but it is quite doable. Now section three is the hardest one of all because that includes the entire restoration of Sapperton Tunnel. In fact, it closed in the 1930s, 33, because of a rockfall. By that time, the TNS had been abandoned anyway for reasons I've explained in other videos. And in subsequent years, there have been further rock falls. There have been some explorations. You have had people going in in the urbex. I'm not an urbex, so don't expect me to go in there <laughs> with a boat <laughs> looking at what you can see inside. But I can show you what I can from photographs that are, as I say, are out of copyright to give you a flavor of what it looks like. And I say, we will be exploring both of the portals and walking across the top to look at some of the shafts, the canal shafts, which are still there, of course, and the soil dumps. So why not join me here on West Country Wanderings for a tour of Sapperton Tunnel. Now here behind me was the site of Bristol Road Wharf. Bristol Road, the A38, which is literally just a few metres there to the left, Westminster Bridge, where you saw me filming earlier. Now this was the first wharf in the direction from Framelode, and the canal reached this point in 1776. And this wharf here had a lot of coal, from the connection obviously with the, later on with the connection to the Gloucester and Sharp Mess Canal at Saul. Also handled roadstone as well. And it did that throughout the majority of the life of the canal. There was also a bridge here called Hyde's Bridge, round about this area. And that was demolished around the same time that the M5 was built and a new connection, the A419 to the A38 was made here. That all sadly went. This is just an exquisite location here. We have the Thames and Seven just below me there, just to insert a shot of that. Now, it is almost dry here. We have had some of the rain the past couple of weeks, past few days have been dry. So it's just kind of a bit of a muddy silt on the, the bottom, but it's completely dry. And you can see the engineering of the canal here very, very clearly. And just this iconic bridge here, the Tarleton Bridge here, just outside the village of Coates. And we have covered, touched on this before, because I did one of my Cotswold walk series. I caught the train to Kemble and I did a circular walk and kind of crossed over a bit of this area, but kind of tantalizingly didn't show you any of this, but uh, here it is in its, all its glory here. Of course, this is phase three for the restoration. This will be the final phase to be restored. But this bit here looks still in pretty good shape because you've got the walls of the canal here, very clearly defined. It's pretty clear as well. The bed of the canal is pretty clear. It just really needs to get back into water. There's probably some leaks, I would think, along the way to make sure that water is retained. So what's been happening with the Cotswold Canals Trust? Well, about three weeks ago, they had a fantastic fundraiser right in the center of Stroud, where the Stroud water and the Thames and Seven Canals meet at Warbridge. And it was the annual raft race. In fact, it was the first time that had been run for three years because of the pandemic, of course. 
I find covering those sort of things really, really difficult because there's lots and lots of people, lots of noise, lots of excitement. But of course, the purpose behind that was to raise lots of money for the Cotswold Canals Trust because they need to get the sections like this restored and of course, many others too. It was a fantastic event, apart from the fact I was feeling a bit overwhelmed. I only managed to cover the morning session of that. The video for that is up now on my channel. I put a link for that in. But I did have fun there. In fact, it was actually covered by a gentleman called David Johns, who runs, I'm sure you know this, Cruising the Cut channel. He did a live event, a live broadcasting event there, covering both the morning and the evening, which is, uh, sorry, the afternoon, which was amazing stuff and really, really technically superb to, to do that. He had uh, Lorna Jane from Lorna Jane's Adventures channel there and Paul and Anthony from Narrowboat Life and Lot. Unfortunately, they were on the other side of the canal and I couldn't get to, to, to meet them. I have since met, met contact with them uh, uh, through social media though, but uh, it was a brilliant event. So if you haven't seen either my video, which is kind of a shorter condensed version, or David's longer live broadcast to the two, one, part one, part two, I think it's like a couple of hours altogether well worth a watch because it's a really exciting event. And I don't know how much money was raised, but um, hopefully it raised a lot of money for the canal restoration. Now, talking of fundraising, about four episodes of the update series ago, we did the Brimscombe Port Bookshop. And in update number 10, I did a piece of camera outside the new bookshop in Stonehouse, which is about three miles to the west of Stroud. And they were getting ready to, re to open a new bookshop there. Well, I'm delighted to say this bookshop has now been opened, had an official opening ceremony just over a week ago now. I popped in there the other day, spoke to the branch manager and allowed me to take some photographs, which I'll just include now the inside of the bookshop there. So if you're ever in this part of the uh, mid to the southern part of Gloucestershire and you're out about exploring the Stradwater and Thames and Seven Canals, highly recommend the visit to both the Brimscombe one and to the one in Stonehouse. It's laid out beautifully. You'd swear it was like a professional Waterstones, W. H. Smiths, probably even better than those in terms of uh, the way it's dis everything's displayed and merchandised into categories. Fantastic range of books on both railways and canals, history books. It's also got a children's section there where children can sit and look at uh, children's books. Adult fiction they've got a great range of. They also sell vinyl records, CDs, DVDs, and jigsaw puzzles and games. It's, yeah, it's wonderful. I, I could spend lots of money, many hours in there, and I'd probably have a load of stuff that I wouldn't have room to store at home. But um, yeah, if you get a chance to go along there, because again, all proceeds go back into the trust to help restore the canal. And the other advantage is that it can helps. It helps the local community as well. Recycling, good for recycling as well. And all the people that work in there are, of course, volunteers. So I'd like at this point to thank all the volunteers, not just in the bookshops, you all do an amazing job in both those bookshops and in the, 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 the centre at both at Saw Junction and the one in Stroud, giving out information, leaflets, telling the paper about that, but also all of the volunteers that were for the Cotswold Canals Trust doing an amazing job in getting this project to fit to back to fruition and getting the canal reopened again to Saw and to the network and beyond in this direction, as you'll see later in today's video. And the final bit of news to share with you, apart from the aforementioned stuff that's happening in Winston with the Whitminster with the archaeological dig and the route of the missing mile being recut through there, which is obviously really exciting stuff. The other news to sell is that Stroud District Council have now appointed a developer for the Brimscombe Port site. If you remember a couple of the updates ago, I showed you the clearance there, I showed you what it was like before, and then I took you back along there to show all those old, horrible, tacky factories that contained asbestos have now been completely demolished and the site completely cleared. It just looks like this great big white open space, ready for developers properly this time. Hopefully, a really good project to get new apartments, cafes, art spaces and most important of all to have the Thames and Severn Canal recut right through the heart of Brimscombe Port, that really historic important area here on the Thames and Severn Canal. So it'd be good to see work on that start. I'm not sure the date that will probably start, probably next year at some point and of course I'll bring you the latest developments on that right here on West Country Wanderings.
So here we are, we've made it to the entrance, or rather the exit, depending on which way you're coming from. This is the Eastern Portal, the Coates Portal, probably the finest neoclassical tunnel entrance anywhere on the British Canal Network. Just tell you about a history of this amazing tunnel here in Gloucestershire on the Thames and Severn Canal. First of all, the length of the tunnel, it's 3,490 metres long. That's 3,817 yards. I know a lot of you prefer yards because that's, of course, how they measured the length of the construction on the Thames and Severn when it was being built. opened on the 20th of April 1789 and closed in 1910 because of various rockfalls, which I'll come on to mention more in a little bit more detail. Now from 1789 to 1811, this canal was nationally renowned because it was the longest tunnel of any description, both canal, railway, road, of any type, anywhere in Great Britain. Now, in 1784, an Act of Parliament was passed, which enabled construction on this amazing tunnel to begin. How did they do it? Well, what they did was they sunk 26 separate shafts straight down from the ground, and then gradually linked them up in the line, present day length of the tunnel. Incredible bit of construction. And when we have a walk later on towards the other entrance, the western portal, the Daneway portal, across the top of the line of the tunnel, we'll see if we can see any of those previous shafts and air shafts to let in air. Of course, one of the dangers of canal tunnels, indeed any type of tunnel, is ventilation and the air quality within it. And that was a consideration for the canal tunnel builders back then, towards the end of the 18th century. Probably thinking, hat on, hat off. Well, actually, really chilly this morning today here. It was about five or six degrees when I left home. But because we're in a deep valley here and the cutting for this canal, it makes it really chilly because only the sun is just petering through now and starting to warm things up. So I walked from my car to this side. I got really cold, I had to go run back to the car, get some gloves, woolly hat. So apologies for hat on, hat off, and different clothing, etc. One of the problems they had with the construction of this tunnel was the local geology. Now from my Cotswold Walks series, you'll know that the Cotswolds claim to fame is the stone, the great Oolitic limestone. 
but that's not the only rock that you will come across as you bore that way both down and through to join the shafts up. The problem is when you meet the Fuller's Earth and it was the Fuller's Earth that gave both the constructors this original tunnel and the people that maintained the Thames and Seven Canal lots of headaches because of roof falls where it meets the you have a weakness where the Fuller's Earth meets the band of the Oolitic limestone. It creates a weakness in the roof of the tunnel, hence there's been many roof falls here, and I'll mention more about that later. Now we said that construction started in 1784, but this tunnel actually opened just five years later in 1789, an amazing accomplishment back in those days at the end of the 18th century. Bear in mind, most of this was done, well, all of it, without any form of mechanical machinery. They would have used explosives and just picks and shovels using the canal navvies. In terms of navigation for the narrow boats, both the Seven Tros and the Thames barges, which would have made their way both up and down through this tunnel here in Gloucestershire, they actually used a process known as legging. There is no towpath along the side of the inside of the Sapperton Tunnel, and therefore you can't have a horse with a rope pulling barges and narrow boats through it. And therefore, the, your only option left to you is to use the legging method. And what they did with that is they put pieces of wood spread out from the outside of the boats and then people would lie on their back on the top of those wooden boards and literally with their legs walk the boat through the tunnel. An exhausting process, also a very wet one. Now the other thing to say about the Coates portal was it was actually restored in 1973. This tunnel, in fact most of it, goes through the Duke of Bathurst land, aka Sirencester Park, and we'll be walking across part of that today when we go through to the other end, the Daneway end, across through Hales Wood. He actually paid partially for this portal here to be restored, including these famous alcoves where statues would have been placed. They never were, but this one here has actually got the name of Henry Glappen. I think he was one of the engineers. I will check that and put that in the usual way below, but they never actually put any statues inside the two little alcoves by the front entrance of the port. The other thing is there's a right eerie sound here at the entrance to the tunnel because you can hear water dripping from the roof onto the entrance or inside of the tunnel to the canal floor, if you like, the canal bed. There is a fence here, so you can't actually access this. They don't want people trespassing or getting in there or causing any damage. There's no way in there. It is a completely uh, gated off entrance to the tunnel here, and I wouldn't recommend it anyway for reasons we'll talk about later in today's video. We're now going to leave the Coates portal entrance, make our way up to the tunnel house in which is currently closed, sadly, and then make our way across to the Daneway by walking across the route of the canal tunnel here in Gloucestershire. This is the famous tunnel house in behind me, sadly closed. I think it closed when we had all the, the lockdowns and hasn't reopened. Hopefully, well, again, it's still in good condition. They have blocked off the car park, so you can't get people coming. You can only walk along it from using the towpath the way I've come from the village of Coates. This actually burnt down. There was a big fire here in the 1950s. I've got a photograph, I'll insert that now. And thankfully it was restored a couple of years later to see it in the condition you can today. So we're now following the Macmillan Way and the Weiss's Way along the line of the Sabaton Tunnel, walking effectively along the top of it. And you think it then carries straight on. Well, to carry on the route, you have to go underneath the railway. This is the Gloucester to Swindon line. And of course, the engineers of this railway had similar problems because there's also a Sapperton railway tunnel, which almost runs not quite parallel, but kind of a diagonal. Do the map so you can see the relationship of the railway tunnel to the canal tunnel. They had equal difficulties in building that through this difficult geological terrain too. But we're going to make our way underneath the railway line and then turn left to continue along the top of the Sapperton tunnel. 
So I'm currently standing on Valley Pit Overbridge, and I do apologise for the aeroplane noises above my head. We're not that far from Cotswold Airport, just over the other way at Kemble. Now, the reason this place is significant, because this is the point just round about here, in fact, just over the other side of that bridge, where the railway line crosses over the top of the Sapperton Canal Tunnel, and it disappears into the eastern end of its own tunnel, just less than a quarter of a mile round that curve. You can't get easy access, so I can't, unfortunately, show you the entrance to the Sapperton Railway Tunnel. But what I have found is something interesting just over here, which proves the location of where the Sapperton Tunnel is, just a few feet behind the camera and then down below my feet. Well, you're probably thinking there's not much to see. It's just a, a fence, but it's not the fence itself that is, of course, is interesting. It's what it's fencing off. There's a triangular shaped fence here by these younger trees. They weren't here originally. And the reason they weren't here is because that there, below the other side of that, or sorry, the other side of that fence is one of the original 26 air shafts I was talking about by the Coates portal that they sunk to build the Sapperton Tunnel. And indeed, the Sapperton Tunnel just lies right down there, just the other side of that fence. An extraordinary fact just to think that, and just, you've got real evidence here to see where that tunnel was originally built. I'm still on the Macmillan Way, making my way towards Dane Way, village of Sapperton. Shortly we'll be crossing over the A419, the main road between Stroud and Sirencester. Just behind me here is some spoil tips. In fact, there's many of these indicating the route of the Sapperton Tunnel. In fact, this is the saw that was originally dug out from the ground to build the Sapperton Canal Tunnel some 250 years ago. Amazing to think that. And if you go on the other side near Trewsbury, you can actually see the line of where the canal runs. They were planted some trees. The Lord Bathurst insisted they were planted to break up the ugly spoils of soil. Not the Lord Bathurst now, but the one when the Sapperton Tunnel was built, of course. And you can see that line of trees and the mounds where the soil was dug out on the horizon. Not sure if we'll be able to see that on the way back. If you do, of course, I'll include that right here in today's video. Anyway, our journey towards the Daneway portal continues. So I've now made it to Broad Ride, just outside the village of Sapperton. This is the edge of Sirencester Park. Sirencester Park runs in that direction. Broad Ride, I think, goes on for about a another mile to indicate the end of Lord Bathurst's estate. Here in the middle of Gloucestershire, we're going to make our way down into the village of Sapperton. I'll probably do a piece to camera at some point, maybe around the, the village or the church, see what I can find anyway, tell you some more about the tunnel, and then we'll finish the video by the Daneway portal. Now we said that there was an Act of Parliament that was passed to enable construction to bin, build, be built after 1794. And you probably think that construction started straight away, but of course it didn't. Like everything in life, politics, there was arguments. And the reason there was an argument here was because of the width of the tunnel. The only previous canal tunnel to have been built of a substantial nature was the Harecastle Tunnel. And that was built to just a width of just over seven foot. Now the problem that the people wanted to build a tunnel here on the Thames and Seven was the fact that the seven troughs were 15 feet wide and the Thames barges 12 feet wide, both of which uh, would not be able to get through a tunnel of just seven foot width. And so there was lots of arguments about what to do about this. Do we do it with just 12 foot? Do we just have a transshipment point at both ends of the tunnel? Of course, that would have made things very difficult and costly and uh, really slowed things down, making the, the canal rather pointless. So in the end, they decided to go ahead and build Sapperton Tunnel to the width of 15 feet. So I'm here at the moment outside Sapperton Church in the village of Sapperton. This is now looked after by the Church's Conservation Trust. It's now fallen out of Church of England ownership due to low numbers. It's actually quite a small village here in Sapperton. Some dormitory and some families have moved away, so it was no longer used. They probably now go to Frampton Mansell or indeed probably on to other places like Campbell or Sirencester. Bit sad, but it's a fantastic church inside of that. I will do that as a separate video because obviously that's not within the context of today's update here on the Thames and Seven Canal. 
Now in terms of the constructions, once they built the 26 shafts that have been sunken down, and we've seen a couple of those today on our travels away from the Coates portal here to the Sapperton portal, they used what were known as headings. So once you got to the base of the shaft, to the line of where the canal bed needs to be in the tunnel, you're spreading out in both directions, uh, up and down, I'll say northerly and southerly because it's not in that alignment, but uh, you're moving it in one direction or another to link up with the, the, the shaft that's at below or above at that particular point. The other difficulty that they had was they, of course, they used explosives to widen up the tunnel, and that gives off a lot of toxic fumes, making conditions for the workmen inside the tunnel really, really difficult. To prevent that or to lessen the degree of which those fumes were there, they actually built chimneys on the top of several of the air shafts. Sadly, none of those survived, those chimneys that is. But amazing to think, <laughs> one of those things they needed to do with all those explosions going on to expand the tunnel was to build chimneys. One of the other things they did to speed up the productivity of building this magnificent tunnel here in Gloucestershire was they constructed a railway. Now, what I mean by a railway, not actually like a steam railway, the existing railway here tonight, is more of a tramway because the steam railway hadn't been invented in those days for actually driving along in the fashion we normally meant that. So it would have been probably pulled by some kind of pulley system because it's too difficult to get to horses actually in some kind of pulley ropes with tracks laid on to enable the debris from the explosions to be pulled out of the tunnel to enable the length of the tunnel to be driven through the Cotswold landscape. Now we've said about the difficulties of the geology here and that is mainly due to the uh, Fuller's Earth. And specifically what happens with that is that when clay gets wet, it expands. So perhaps two thirds, four fifths of the tunnel is fine because it's going through great oolite and you've got the exposed raw rock there. So if there is a bit of a expansion, it's not a problem. But where you've had to line the tunnel with brickwork, which is what they've had to do with the Fuller's Earth section, it expands, causing two problems. One the aforementioned rock falls, and two, it actually expands the base, the canal bed, and lifting it up. And of course, if you have a narrow boat, a barge or tro going through the tunnel, it means there's then restricted headroom because the boat is higher up because the, the canal bed has been lifted up because of all that saturated clay. Now, the tunnel opened on the 20th of April, 1789, but only just a, a year after the, the tunnel opened, they had to close it again for a period of 10 weeks because of poor workmanship, enabling lots of work to be done because there was dangers that there was going to be more roof force, even all as far back that time, shortly after the construction of the tunnel. Now we've said that the Sapperton Tunnel was the longest canal tunnel on the network in Great Britain. And that ceased to be in 1811 because in 1811, the Standedge Tunnel in Yorkshire on the Huddersfield Narrow Canal Network, that's a mouthful isn't it, that opened which superseded the length of this tunnel here in Sapperton. That tunnel, Stand Edge that is, is still in existence in Yorkshire and you'll probably find well there are many YouTubers that have actually travelled that so if you want to see what a tunnel is like to go through a, a substantial canal tunnel you can actually go and search out channels like Cruising the Cat, David Johns from that, plus many, many more that have traveled through the Standard Tunnel to give you a flavor and a taste of what it would have been like to have gone through this one here at Sapperton. Now, of course, it's still a desire of the Cotswold Canals Trust to reconnect the River Severn to the River Thames. It would mean a substantial amount of work to be done on the Sapperton Tunnel. About two thirds of it are fine because they're passing through the Olytic Limestone but as much as a third will need substantial work and of course sadly money to be spent on it but it wouldn't be fantastic to see narrowboats passing through this wonder of the canal network once again here so i've now walked down the hill very very slippery there must be that full as earth from the village of sapperton i'm actually now on the towpath of the thames and seven canal it's also the t and s way Obviously that links up the Thames and Severn. Got that blue, iconic blue, but obviously it doesn't follow the canal all the way as we've seen because of the land ownership rights, that kind of thing it has to diverge away in several places. In front of me, about half a mile, is the pub, the Daneway. There was also another pub behind that. Name escapes me now. I think I've got a photograph of that. 
if I can find out, I'll, I'll appear on the screen round about now after filming this when I'm doing the editing. But the most important thing is what's down in this way behind me. So this is it, this is the Daneway or Saberton portal, designed and built by one Josiah Klaus, chief engineer between 1784 and 1789 before the canal built. It's just amazing just to be here. You can hear the water just dripping inside of the tunnel there. It's, it has that real, real atmosphere to it here with just that sound of the water dripping and the stillness of the woodland around you. This portal was actually restored by the Cotswold Canals Trust back in 1996 and it was opened by, or reopened, should I say, by Lord Apsley in September of that year. Well, I don't think you could find a more fitting place to close Canal Update number 11 here on West Country Wanderings, part of the Stradwater and Thames and Seven Canal Update series. Yes, of course, there will be an update number 12. Not sure when that will be, perhaps into the new year now. There will be other canal content on my channel too, particularly from the Wilts and Barks Canal. We'll be going over to Royal Wood and Bassett too, and the Kennet and Avon Canal. So from here, at the entrance to the magnificent Sapperton Tunnel on the Thames and Seven Canal, I'll say goodbye. Look after yourselves, take care, and I hope to see you on the channel again very soon. All the best for now. Cheers. Bye-bye.